Good evening. I'm Mr. Marek, and you're not. In this video, we're studying capacitors. A capacitor is a, a device which stores electric charge. Usually, capacitors are constructed out of two conductors which are close to each other but are not touching. If they were touching, then they'd just be wires. One of the most common ways to create a capacitor is what's called a parallel plate capacitor. There you take two conducting plates and line them up parallel to each other, like that. The area of the plates would be A, and the distance between them would be D. And then you can charge up those plates by connecting them to a battery or something like that. Another way to create a capacitor is what's called a cylindrical capacitor. In a cylindrical capacitor, you have two conductors again, but this time they're arranged in a cylinder shape. So one conductor in the middle and then a second conductor surrounding it. Either way, you have two conductors with space in between them. In a circuit, the symbol for a capacitor is simply two parallel lines, kind of like that. Don't confuse that with a battery, because remember, a battery has one line longer than the other to denote a, the positive end of the battery. Capacitors can be charged when they are connected to a battery or another source of electric potential. So we take each side of the capacitor and connect it to one end of a battery. When you do that, the two sides will acquire opposite charge. One will become positive, the other will become negative. So here's a simple picture. There's a battery of voltage V, and we connect it to the sides of our capacitor. Now this picture is definitely not drawn to scale. So when that happens, the side that's connected to the negative in the battery will become negatively charged, and the other side will become positively charged. When it reaches its full charge, the voltage difference across the capacitor is equal to the voltage of the battery. So if you connect a capacitor to a 9 volt battery, it will eventually acquire a potential difference of 9 volts. The charge on each plate is going to be called Q. And again, one requires a positive Q, and the opposite side acquires the same charge, but just negative. Now the amount of charge that actually gets collected on the capacitor is going to depend on two things. One is the voltage across it. Obviously, the higher the voltage is, the more charge you can put on each plate, and the more energy you have available. And then the second factor is just the design of the capacitor itself. The way that we quantify this is with the term capacitance. The term capacitance is given the symbol capital C. And so the equation we could use to figure out the charge on a capacitor is just the capacitance times the voltage. So let's dig into this term capacitance a little bit. Basically, it's just a measure of how well a capacitor will store charge. Basically, it depends only on the geometry of the capacitor. Basically, how you put it together. So bringing back my parallel plate drawing, the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor, which is the only one we really need to know about, the bigger the area, the more charge we can store on there. The closer they are together, the more charge we can store on there. And then the third factor is just the nature of space itself. And this is a term we've seen already once before, the term epsilon naught. So epsilon naught represents the vacuum permittivity, which is basically a measure of how well space will conduct an electric field. And so it's got a value of 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th coulomb squared over newton times meter squared. So remember, back when we did Coulomb's Law for the first time, uh, we mentioned that K, the charge constant in that equation,
is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And epsilon naught is that vacuum permittivity. So with Coulomb's law, we just simplified it to k. We do capacitance, we really can't do that. So it's the property of the space between the plates that is the final factor in that equation. The unit for capacitance, we know that epsilon naught has units coulomb squared over newton times meter squared. And then we know area will be measured in meters squared. And then distance we measured in meters. So the simplest thing to do is to cancel out the meter squared on top, which is in blue, and one of them that's on bottom, the stuff in the orange, and then your unit becomes Coulomb squared, and then on bottom you have a Newton and a meter. Remember that a Newton times a meter is a joule. So the unit for capacitance is Coulomb squared per joule. That unit is called a farad, given the symbol capital F, and farad is short for Faraday, named after an Englishman named Michael Faraday, who discovered and quantified a lot of these um, electrostatic terms we learned about. He was the one that basically came up with the idea for the electric field. A farad is a ridiculously large unit. It is very unlikely that you would ever see in your lifetime a capacitor bigger than one farad. So typically things on the order of pico farads and micro farads are more reasonable. So because a capacitor stores charge and in order to make those charges move into the capacitor work has to be done on them then a capacitor must store energy stores electrical potential energy. So the equation that gives us the electric potential energy, which I'm not going to take the time to derive, is simply one half Q times V. Q being the charge on the capacitor, V being the voltage across the capacitor. Now most of the time we don't really know what Q is but C is something that's usually printed on a capacitor, so we could just substitute the quantity CV in there for Q. Make the equation look more like that. And so it look like U equals one-half CV squared. We could also replace V in that equation, and instead of one-half QV, we can make it look like one-half Q squared over C. Now the two versions that are on your equation chart are those two, the one-half QV, the one-half CV squared. Typically, the second one that we wrote, this one right here, is going to be more useful because the things that are typically known or given to you are things like capacitance and the electric potential. That just saves you a step in your calculations. Um, last thing to consider, up until now, we have basically assumed we have um, nothing between the plates of our capacitor except for empty space. Basically, we've assumed that there is a vacuum. And my misspelling is kind of bothering me. Let's fix that. Sorry about that. Real capacitors will have often have something besides empty space between them. Usually they're made so that there's an insulator between the plates. These insulators are referred to as dielectrics. And the meaning behind that name is really beyond the scope of what we need to learn in this class. So dielectric, insulator, you can kind of say the same thing. Later on, you'll take more advanced classes, you'll understand what the, those dielectrics are actually doing. What they are doing as far as we're concerned is they conduct, quote unquote conduct, the electric field differently than a vacuum will. And so we're going to modify that equation a little bit. Instead of just epsilon a on top, we're going to add a third letter, and that is the Greek letter kappa.
So a kind of cursive K is a kappa, not to be confused with a capital C for the constant in Coulomb's law. So be careful with that. Kappa is called the dielectric constant. The dielectric constant does not have a unit. So it's just a number that depends on the material that's inserted between the plates of our capacitor. To give you a few examples, the dielectric constant for air is 1.0006, which is close enough to 1 that that's what we'll use um, in our calculations. So if we don't have anything but air in between the plates of our capacitor, then we won't even have to worry about a value for kappa. Rubber, which is a common insulator, however, has a um, kappa dielectric constant of 6.7. And again, there's no units behind that. And so rubber is a common insulator. Inserting that rubber in between the plates of a capacitor will increase the capacitance and allow you to store more charge on there when it's connected to the same voltage. So let's look at a simple example. So suppose we have a parallel plate capacitor and the plates have an area of 5 times 10 to the negative 5th square meters. So that's normal size. That's something that will fit in your hand. And they're separated by 0 0.0001 meter. So basically a tenth of a millimeter. And we fill the space in between the plates with a sheet of paper. It's about the thickness of a piece of paper. And then we connect it to a 10 volt battery. We want to find how much charge is gathered on the capacitor and then how much energy is stored in the capacitor. So before we do either of those things, we need to figure out the capacitance. And so capacitance is kappa epsilon naught A over D. So plugging in our numbers, kappa is 3.7. Epsilon naught is that ridiculous number there. Area is 5 times 10 to the negative 5th square meters. And then we have that really small distance on bottom. Don't forget the value for um, epsilon naught is on your equation chart. Look it up whenever we need it. And so when you do that math, you get something like 1.6 times 10 to the negative 11. And then canceling out the units, cancel out the meters squared. And then our unit becomes Coulomb squared over Newton times meter. So right now you might just leave like that, or you may write it like Coulomb squared over um, joules. You could write farads, but then it would be difficult to see how the rest of the units in this question worked out. So I'm just going to leave it like that. Next find the charge. Just plug into Q equals C times V. And so this is just simple multiplication. And so just multiply by 10. I mean just change the number on my times 10 there. And then the Coulomb squared will cancel out one of the Coulombs on bottom there. Remember a Newton times a meter is the same as a joule, so the Newton meter and the joule cancels out, leaving me with just a Coulomb, which is what we would expect our unit for charge to be. So that's a really, really, really small charge, but again, this is something that would fit in your hand. This is a small capacitor. So to find the energy in the capacitor, we could just use 1 half QV. And again, this is just simple multiplication. Instead of writing 10 volts, I'm going to write it like 10 joules per coulomb. And see, I'm just multiplying. The coulombs cancel out, leaving me with joules, which is what I would expect my answer for energy to be in. So the you know, equations and calculations and problems with this are going to be relatively simple. Um, make sure we keep track of our units. That's going to kind of be the hard part. Okay, some uses for capacitors. Why would we care about these things? Uh, one use of them is if we want to store charge. Now you might go, well, don't we use a battery to store charge? And the answer is yes. Um, but cap capacitors often can release that charge much, much faster than a battery can. And so a camera flash uses a capacitor to quickly release all that charge because we just want the camera to flash for a very small 
period of time, but we want it to be very bright. Um, capacitors are often used in things like battery backups for computers and other electrical equipment, things like that. The second thing that they're often used for is for any circuit that's based on timing. So things like clocks, radios, cell phones, um, things like that all have capacitors to control the timing. Third thing is anything involving a circuit that's going to move or something that's going to touch the circuit to cause something else to happen, like push buttons, like keyboards and calculators. Um, they're important in electrical filters, such as an amplifier. And without capacitors, we wouldn't really be able to make things like calculators um, because they were what control the voltage, and that's how calculators work um, to add numbers, basically. Basically, they're just adding voltages, and then they display the voltage that they got on the screen. So there's all kinds of uses for these capacitor things. Notice that they're all about circuits. So in our next unit on circuits, we'll learn more about how capacitors are used and why they're important. But it's kind of a you know, good idea to get the basics behind us right now while we're still learning about charge and voltage and all that stuff. So that's the end of this video. Once again, I'm Mr. Marek, and you're not. Ta-ta.